What we're going to do is start off with some brief opening comments from uh, each of our panelists on some of the things that they think are most important in terms of uh, more productive uh, biomedical innovation, improving the, uh, the, the research and development process. And I think they'll each probably touch uh, most on some of the areas that they're most directly involved with, uh, 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 with in terms of new activities. Uh, on this critical topic. And then we're going to have some discussion very much like what you heard in this first back and forth with, uh, uh, with Senator Bennett. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Collins. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for the invitation to be part of this panel and looking forward to the discussion. And certainly was a very impressive beginning uh, that Senator Bennett offered up. Uh, my goodness, what an articulate, thoughtful presentation of where we need to go. I hope that that uh, view, those sets of views that he was putting forward are infectious uh, to all of his colleagues. We need an epi <laughs> epidemic of good, good thinking here. Uh, it is a very paradoxical time uh, from where I sit as the director of the NIH, the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. Uh, we have scientifically never seen a time as exciting as this. The potential of understanding at the detailed molecular level how life works and how disease occurs is just simply breathtaking. And it's built upon a whole range of advances and technologies, most of which have come along pretty recently. So it's an exhilarating time to be involved in science. But the paradoxical side of that is it's also the most stressful time that people who've been working in biomedical research in academia or at NIH can remember, because the resources are not matched up to the opportunities. And that means that if you're a grantee out there at a university and one of the fine uh, institutions across this country, and you send your grant to NIH hoping to get it supported, your chances now are only about 17 percent uh, that that grant will actually be awarded. Traditionally, it's been more like 30 percent. And that puts enormous stress on this system and causes a lot of bright, talented investigators to be pretty shaken up and demoralized and to spend a huge amount of their time just writing and rewriting and resubmitting and then getting disappointed once again, instead of doing the research, which is what they thought they were supposed to be trained to do. And we have a real risk here of losing some of those investigators as they basically give up after too many defeats and move on to something else or to some other country. So there's that paradox. Great science, really squeeze on the resources. In therapeutics, which is a main topic, I think, for things we'll talk about this morning, there's another paradox. We have this absolute deluge of discoveries about the molecular basis of disease, most of which have just arrived uh, in the last few years. You would think that would be positioning us uh, to discover lots of new successful targets and lots of new therapeutics would be rolling through the pipeline and out into registration and approval. But in fact, if you look over the course of the last 60 years, and there's a diagram that will be shown in the second panel that actually calculates what has been the success in getting drugs approved as a function of the dollars of R&D invested into that. And it is a very disturbing graph. It's on a log scale, and it's basically going downward. And it almost looks linear, like there's a law involved. And the authors of this Nature Review Drug Discovery article, uh, tongue-in-cheek, called this e -Room's Law, which happens to be Moore's Law written backwards. <laughs> Moore's Law, of course, the law for computers, which says things get better exponentially. Uh, but in fact, in terms of therapeutic approvals, oh, we're going in the wrong direction. So what is that about? How can we have all of this remarkable new sets of discoveries and yet a real challenge in terms of capitalizing on those for effective therapeutics? And then the third paradox, I think, relates to the United States. We have here in this country, I would argue, a collection of the most remarkable, bright, capable, energetic, visionary scientists uh, that you would hope to see. And yet, if you look at the way in which U.S. contributions to biomedical research are following a trajectory, it too is a disturbing picture. There's a recent report uh, from the Information Technology Innovation Foundation together with UMR uh, that basically is titled Leadership in Decline. If you have not looked at this, it's very sobering, and it basically paints a picture of what's happened to U.S. competitiveness on the global stage in biomedical research over the last 25 years as compared to what's happening in other countries like Singapore or the United Kingdom or China or India. Uh, and it is quite troubling to see how the dominance that we had in this field in the 1980s, which was unquestioned, has been seriously eroding, especially in the last decade, without much being done about it. And again, that is a consequence of the fact that many other countries are ramping up their support for biomedical research 
sometimes in double-digit percentages each year, as China and India are doing, or even in the face of difficult economics, uh, as the EU is talking about doing, despite their challenges, they're still talking about perhaps a 45, 47 percent increase in biomedical research support over the next seven-year period. Meanwhile, the U.S., at least as measured by what's happening at NIH, has lost about 20 percent of its purchasing power in the last nine years, with flat budgets being <clears throat> eroded by inflation. So perhaps it's not surprising then when you measure productivity, you see that also has been losing ground uh, to competition on the global stage. Now, don't get me wrong, I celebrate what the other countries in the world are able to do. That's fantastic. We are a global community. Discovery is about uh, making inroads into areas where we need new information. That's all fine as long as the information is made available. It doesn't matter particularly which country does it. But if we believe, and I think the evidence is very strong, that this kind of research is a major driver of our economy, and you can show that many economists have done so, then we're missing out on the chance uh, to build our economy back to its maximum strength by the fact that we are undercapitalizing uh, this part uh, of our, our own enterprise. So let me just quickly then come to NIH and what we might be trying to do about this in terms of our own contribution, even in stressed budgetary times. And the major thing that has happened in the last year that relates to our topic of today is the formation of a new center, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, NCATS. Uh, this was recommended to me by a scientific management review board chaired by Norm Augustine as a way of creating a hub for activity in therapeutic, diagnostic, and device development at NIH. It's not that we hadn't been doing that. Actually, we probably spend five or six billion dollars each year working on therapeutics, diagnostics, and devices scattered amongst the 27 institutes and centers. But those are focused on specific disease applications. There had not been a hub to really look at this challenge of why it is so hard to achieve success. And it is hard. The, the, the uh, statistics are frightening. If you, if you today uh, pick a target that you think would be appropriate for therapeutics, for cancer, for Alzheimer's disease, for diabetes, uh, you can count on, unless things change, a 14-year timetable between your starting this and actually getting to success, and actually that success will happen less than 1% of the time. The rest will be failures. And the overall cost, therefore, will be in billions of dollars because you have to pay for all of those failures as well. That's simply not a pipeline that is going to serve us well when you consider we have now thousands of diseases for which we have molecular understanding, but maybe only 250 or so for which we have treatments. So we have this huge gap and an opportunity to fill that gap, but this pipeline ain't going to do it. So NCATS aims to, in collaboration with industry, step back and look at the bottlenecks the way an engineer would. What's wrong here that we could address if we utilized some of the new science, which is exciting stuff, and tackled some of the old problems? Let me just give you three examples of things that we've already started to do, even though this center just got started officially last December 23rd. One is to try to tackle this problem of target validation. Everybody agrees in the private or public sector that an awful lot of the problem is you pick a target, you go through all this trouble of designing a molecule that attacks it, either it's a biologic or it's a small molecule, and you've proved that it's safe, and you get all the way to that phase two or phase three trial, and darn it, it doesn't work. It's not effective. You pick the wrong target, at least for that disease. How do we do a better job early in validating that target so that you know if you go to all that trouble, you're likely to end up with a successful outcome? Industry is profoundly interested in that. So are we at NIH. So are many academics. I'm sure Ron will talk about this. And there are ways, increasingly, uh, to go beyond what has traditionally been the case, which are cell models or animal models, to doing more target validation in humans. One way, by the way, is to take advantage of nature's experiment on all of us, which has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. There's a human knockout project going on. We don't have to engineer it ourselves. Nature has been doing that. All of you in this room are walking around with about 100 genes that have significant flaws in them. And sorry to tell you that if you thought you were the perfect specimen. <laughs> If we could, because we are now able to do that kind of DNA sequencing at a prodigiously high throughput and low cost, identify what the cause is or what the outcome is of loss of function of each one of those 20,000 genes, we would find some real nuggets where some of those are actually protective 
And think about what a great model that is for validating a target. You would know that that person who's missing or is deficient in that particular product actually has a benefit that says that if you design a drug for everybody else, uh, they would probably be benefited. And it tells you about toxicity as well. You can see, are there negative consequences or not? There are already some very nice examples where that's been reduced to practice, but we could do this systematically. That kind of conversation is going on right now with industry as well as an opportunity to put together in an information commons all of the data that one would need in order to try to assess the attractiveness of a particular target. And this has led to two very high-level workshops and an ongoing steering committee between myself, some other leaders at NIH, and several leaders of R&D in pharma, which is looking pretty productive. So there's an area of intention. A second one, how is it that we decide whether a particular compound is safe to give to that first human uh, patient in a phase one trial. You go through all these steps of doing what we call preclinical toxicology. You assess whether the compound does something bad to certain cells that give you signatures of that sort. And then you give it to small animals and large animals at various doses, and you try to ask the question whether something bad happened. And ultimately, uh, you get data. And unfortunately, the data is often not what you were really hoping for, because it turns out not to be that predictive. Could we do a better job? We think we could. So working with FDA and with DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, we are designing a biochip which will be loaded up with human cells, human cells that are differentiated into liver, heart, kidney, brain, and a few others, in three-dimensional organoids so that they are as close as possible to what you would see in vivo, but they're on a chip, and wired up with outputs uh, to talk to you about gene expression, about epigenetics, metabolomics, proteomics. The goal then is to determine what's the signature of a toxic compound and what's the signature of a safe compound. And can you use this biochip prospectively in a way that's more reliable than the way we currently do toxicology? It's ambitious. It's a five-year effort. We're going to spend $140 million on this, half from DARPA, half from NIH. And I think we'll end up with something pretty interesting. Third example, and then I'll move uh, along to the other speakers here. There is a real opportunity to try to short circuit that 14-year development timeline uh, for a new therapeutic. If you could identify a compound which has already gone through many of those steps, and I'm talking about compounds that get to phase two or phase three, but turn out not to be effective for the application that they were originally tested for, and that is a very frequent finding. But those compounds are like gold. We know a lot about them. You know what their target is. You know their metabolism, what dose to give, and so on. Uh, if you could find that that same compound, even though it failed, say, for diabetes, might turn out to be the right thing for cancer, you could immediately go to a phase two trial. And you could, if that's successful, uh, basically trim off a decade of work and tens or hundreds of millions of dollars because all of that had already been done. If that sounds improbable to you, I could cite you uh, at least a dozen examples where that kind of repurposing has been successful, AZT maybe being a famous one. Well, could we do that systematically? So just in the last few weeks, eight companies uh, have been compelled by this argument as a win for them, have agreed to make available 58 compounds that have all gone through that process are known to be safe in humans, but did not succeed in being applicable for the original uh, disease where they were tested. Those 58 compounds are now being crowdsourced by investigators in academia or in biotech or whoever has a good idea about a new application. They can get access to the compound. They can test it out. NIH will support that through NCATS. And we'll see whether we hit some home runs. Everybody wins if that happens. The company still has the IP on the compound. The investigator gets some intellectual property on the use of that compound. So royalties, if they occur, flow to both. But the big winner should be the public, because maybe then we will get, in a short period of time, therapeutic successes for diseases that otherwise might have to wait a very long time. Those are the kinds of innovative approaches that are now possible with the new science that's there. I'm sure there are many other things we could talk about on this panel, but I thought it'd be good to have some specific examples in front of you as we go through this conversation. Francis, thanks for starting with those specifics, in addition to giving some uh, very helpful framing uh, comments about the challenges, too. So, uh, Dr. DePeno, I'll turn to you next. Uh, how do you see some of these challenges from the standpoint of a, a major academic center? Well, that was a great setup, and I have <laughs> to say that the NCATS uh, concept is a brilliant one. But just taking a macro view of this, we talked about investment earlier. 
Um, essentially, over the last century, we've doubled life expectancy from about 42 to 74 today worldwide. By 2025, we're going to have 1.2 billion people worldwide over the age of 60. Beyond the age of 60, every five years, the incidence of the great four diseases, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer doubles. By the time you're 85, you have a 45% chance of having Alzheimer's. If you're a man, a one in two chance of having cancer. So it's not like we sh whether or not we should invest in this. We talk about bending the healthcare curve by virtue of making things more efficient, evidence-based medicine. That is, of course, extremely important. But the only answer to solving these problems, and we're on this huge collision course as a result of the changing demographics, is science. We have to understand what actually causes these diseases in the first place, prevent them if possible, and if they do occur, to treat them in a way that elicits durable responses. That is the only answer. There's no other business model out there that will really solve the several fold increase in these major diseases over the next several decades, just by virtue of the aging of the world population. More specifically, when we think about cancer or Alzheimer's, cancer specifically, I think it's pretty clear that we've had a broken cancer drug development ecosystem. You have a 95% failure rate, 56% of failures occurring in phase three clinical trials. So if you ask yourself, why have we failed? We failed in part because, until relatively recently, we didn't have these transformative technologies that enabled us to truly understand the fundamental underpinnings of cancer. So to a certain extent, we were flying blind. That has changed, and that's changed very, very quickly. And so now we have this extraordinary capability to sequence for hundreds of dollars, what took a few billion uh, only 10 years ago advances in artificial intelligence, the ability to manipulate genes at will, the ability to create model organisms that recapitulate very faithfully the human condition, the ability to analyze human biospecimens uh, so that we can really interrogate what's going on when a drug is applied to a patient, a tumor, or a specific disease organ site. These are truly historic advances, and they are significant advances. And this is going to provide us with very good visibility on what makes cancer tick, the underpinnings of Alzheimer's, and so on, that will allow us to provide therapeutic points of attack. But the issue has not simply been conceptual. The issue relates also to organizational constructs. That is to say, for a long time now, we've had academia, which has been a cauldron of discovery, that has brought us these major technological advances, these major conceptual breakthroughs. We've had biotech, which has licensed discoveries out of the academic sector and brought that concept to a, uh, that asset to a proof of concept to inspire biopharma to invest in that and bring it across the commercialization goal line. On a macro level, we've had large pharma that has shifted its resources to late stage development and commercialization. And we've had biotech, especially since about 2007, under very significant economic pressure. And the funding of those companies have not been sufficient to be able to do things in a way that really allow us to get a line of sight with respect to the drugs that are being developed. So if you ask yourself, why do we have a 95% failure rate when we get into the clinic? It's not simply that we don't understand the target. It's that the system itself is not well configured to do the due diligence at the preclinical level to truly understand a target. Understand the target, where the target is rate limiting, so you know which patients to apply that particular drug. And so in order to uh, arrive at a solution, what we've done at MD Anderson is to develop a construct that brings the best attributes of academia, which is discovery, rigorous science, patience, designed to not just validate, but devalidate, kill, potentially the 19 out of 20 failures. Academia has been very good at doing deep science. In addition, we brought also a culture of milestone-driven, team-oriented, time-sensitive, 
kinds of activities where we bring industry seasoned individuals that understand what it takes in terms of developing an asset and getting that asset to a level of validation so that when you reach a lead clinical candidate, you understand which fight to pick in the clinic. So the system, both academic and industry, is not well configured to do that level of validation. In academia, you have largely trainees, graduate students, and postdocs that are doing experiments designed to further their thesis, their careers, they're pursuing truth, they're pursuing fundamental knowledge. It's not about the kinds of experiments that you need to assess whether or not a target is an important target, whether or not the drug hits the target, and which biomarkers you might need for target engagement or patient selection. In industry, you don't have these companies being capitalized enough, nor do they have the freedom to operate, to use the latest technologies, the suite of model systems and so on, to be able to truly validate that target. And if anything, the biotech sector is configured to support programs uh, to create the perception of value so that they reach a point where they would inspire the support of pharma, as opposed to killing the project because uh, it, the science doesn't necessarily support that. So it's, the system is really motivated to support programs that shouldn't be supported, because if they were eliminated, then that company may cease to exist. So we have to ask ourselves, is there a construct that we can develop to bring the ball down the field so that the launch point into the private sector is far more productive? Better for investors, biotechnology has been the worst performing biotech sec uh, sector, private equity sector in the last 15 years. It's been negative. We've had hundreds of billions of dollars of lost market cap in the top 10 pharmaceutical companies. So the system is not performing well. So the question is, can we help the entire ecosystem? So at MD Anderson, we created the Institute for Applied Cancer Science. So in this, brown, in this protoplasm of Brownian motion, brilliant discovery science that goes on in academia, we embedded a backbone of directed activity with industry seasoned individuals that take discoveries from the academic environment and bring that down the field of validation to a level where you have a very strong clinical path hypothesis. And at that point, you then have a choice to either further develop it internally or to launch it, license it, start new companies, et cetera. That point of validation, I think, is what's critically required for us to move forward and ensure that the, the kinds of drugs that we're bringing forward into clinical trials would have a much higher probability of success. If that level of validation exists, if you've got good biomarkers to select patients, just like the BRAF uh, targeted agent in melanoma, we knew within two dozen patients that we had a drug, and this drug was going to be extremely successful. And so that's an example of exploiting genomics, developing targeted therapies against that specific alteration, selecting the patients for that targeted alteration, and then embarking on a clinical trial that had very accelerated approval. We went from the discovery, 2002, 2009, we had a drug that was saving lives in the clinic. So that is one of many examples. The more challenging issue, however, is that the Genome Project, the Cancer Genome Project, has just handed us a treasure trove of unprecedented targets. These are targets that we do not yet know whether they are rate limiting or where they are rate limiting, against what genetic background, against what uh, tumor biology will they be very important from a drug development standpoint. The system is not configured to prosecute those unprecedented targets. And the only place where that can happen is in the academic setting to really do the deep biological studies needed to get a line of sight for those particular assets. So we need to solve the front end of the drug development equation. This challenge is not limited to cancer. We, are, uh, we have a hypothesis called the amyloid hypothesis in, in Alzheimer's. And it's exceedingly clear that that hypothesis, while important, uh, is not sufficient. It's going to be sufficient for us to really move the needle on that disease. There are likely to be many co-conspirators that are operating 
uh, that really affect uh, decline in brain health. And there we have an even greater challenge of not quite understanding, as we do in cancer, uh, what the targets are uh, and how we should be able to prosecute those targets from the validation standpoint. So the challenges we face for the great diseases are significant. With respect to cancer, I'm filled with optimism that we have enough of a conceptual framework, we have enough technologies to be able to understand the underpinnings of the disease, we out have the uh, ability to implement that, uh, that knowledge in a way that's really going to impact on the cancer problem. The biggest concern that I have is more of an organizational one, one that we really need to solve in a very significant way. I think the NCATS is an excellent example of how we're really developing new paradigms uh, to be able to bring together academic industry principles that enable us to really move the needle on these great diseases. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, uh, Dr. DePeno. Um, Commissioner Hamburg, I'd like to turn to, to you now uh, for some perspectives from where you sit at the FDA. I know you've been uh, struggling to, uh, to find some ways to make progress on these issues as well. Great. Well, I'm delighted to be part of this distinguished group, and I applaud you for pulling this meeting together and also this panel that really has all of the critical sectors um, uh, represented, um, except for the, the patient groups, um, which are increasingly an important voice as we think about advancing biomedical innovation. Um, and I think I'll start big and then narrow in on some FDA-specific things so that I can pick up on some of the themes that have um, just been raised. Uh, and FDA does sit in kind of a unique position to, on the one hand, look out and see what are the um, under-addressed public health and medical care needs, and on the other, sort of what's in the pipeline and, and who's contributing what as um, we try um, as a scientific community to translate advances in biomedical science and new discoveries into real world products that people need and are counting on. I want to begin, as I said, broad and you know, maybe at 60,000 feet um, to, to, to observe that this is a critical moment for us um, as a community committed to biomedical innovation, but for our nation more broadly. Um, to really make sure, as Francis um, uh, underscored, that we remain on the cutting edge of this critical area um, that so much matters for both health and the robustness of our economy. And I think it really requires um, us to address the whole ecosystem, as, as um, Dr. Um, DePino mentioned, there really is an ecosystem. And I think that we need to work together to make sure that we understand all of the critical components of this ecosystem, that all of those elements recognize that they are part of a critically important team, and that we identify what are some of the, the, the formidable barriers and the extraordinary opportunities that are currently before us to really um, advance biomedical product innovation. And I think it means that we address issues that, that span the whole continuum from uh, intellectual property and um, patent issues to economic policies, incentives, uh, tax credits, access to capital, and other things um, that are hardly in my domain of expertise but critically important um, to the agenda before us. Then, of course, there are the investments in science and the importance that we find the right balance between investments um, in discovery and fundamental research that fuel innovation now and for the future, but also um, the importance of translational research. And, and of course, Francis and his work on NCATS is, is uh, uniquely important there. Um, but also the importance of, of regulatory science. And I'm going to come back to talk more about that. But that final bridge that enables us uh, to get products that are uh, safe and effective, stable and reliable, um, and actually provide a clinical benefit. Because I think it's important for us to recognize that innovation, at the end of the day, really only matters if it matters for people, mm -hmm. if it produces a real benefit um, in the healthcare setting, in communities, and in the lives of individuals. 
Um, we also need to think about reimbursement policies because that's an important underlying uh, driver of uh, this whole set of, of issues and what kinds of investments will be made and um, the, the continuing uh, forward movement of the engines of innovation. And some would even say we need to address immigration policy because uh, we need to make sure we've got the best and the brightest scientific minds working on these problems. And um, we need to make sure that our investments in training are, are realized in our, our work. And I think, of course, as we think about this ecosystem, we recognize that, that partnership and collaboration is essential uh, to our progress and that, that we really um, you know, have a, a very special opportunity. And I think the representation of this panel uh, reflects that to really all be thinking together about what are our relative roles and how can we synergize. Um, and at this time of enormous economic constraints in every domain of activity, we need to, to leverage resources as effectively as possible, both dollar resources and human resources. So I'm very excited about the opportunity to really uh, work across sectors and across disciplines to develop a national strategy, um, formal or informal. We're certainly working hard on that now uh, within the administration. Um, a few months ago, uh, the president and his Office of Science and Technology Policy put out what is sort of a first step, a, a blueprint for the bioeconomy, and we want to you know, really um, build on that and, and extend it um, to make sure that we are not missing this critical opportunity for our nation, for science, and for health. Let me take just a couple of minutes to drill down a little bit more about um, what's happening at FDA and how we see our changing role. Not only are we trying to be more activists on advancing biomedical innovation um, writ large, but we're also taking a very hard look at what can we do as an agency uh, to uh, ensure that we are a gateway, not a barrier um, to innovation. Of course, never uh, forgetting the critical and essential and unique role we play in assuring safety and efficacy standards for the intended use of these products uh, and, um, and supporting uh, these critical needs. Um, we are in the midst of an enormous amount of activity within FDA, and you all recognize that um, last night marked a very important advance, the um, passage of our new legislation, the, the reauthorization of some critical user fees, and um, the addition of some historic new ones, but also new um, responsibilities, authorities, and opportunities for FDA um, in the regulatory arena. Um, we haven't quite decided what to call this, whether it's going to be FDASIA or FDASIA or FDA, SIA, but uh, we have to find the right uh, phrase that will roll off all of our tongues, but it is a landmark moment, um, and I think that uh, it gives us the opportunity to continue our efforts, uh, regulatory reform, to, to have the kind of, of stable, reliable funding that we need uh, to help us make our regulatory pathways as, as transparent, as consistent, and predictable as possible to streamline and modernize our business processes um, and to really try to, to um, provide as much clarity as possible about the, the, the regulatory standards and expectations. We also, um, through this legislation and, and through our broader activities, are trying to find ways to exercise the greatest regulatory flexibility that we can. And I think that that has been seen in, in many of our recent approvals in terms of the emphasis on priority reviews to get important products reviewed as quickly as possible, uh, to use accelerated approval, which we hope to expand, which has made a real difference, um, enabling us to use surrogate endpoints to have uh, uh, more rapid uh, clinical trials and to move products out into the marketplace while continuing uh, to study them in a, a supervised and controlled way, um, and uh, using other tools that are, are at our disposal uh, in terms of flexibility. 
But we also recognize that a lot of what people refer to as regulatory uncertainty, in fact, reflects scientific uncertainty, and that we have to continue to work together. And this must be in a collaborative, cross-sectoral, and cross-disciplinary way uh, to ensure that we have developed the critical areas of science, which I refer to as regulatory science, that provide the knowledge and the tools um, for the most effective and efficient uh, review of the safety, quality, um, efficacy, and performance of medical uh, products that gives us new methods, approaches, models, and standards um, for regulatory review, and it also has huge implications for the development process as well, and really um, more effective integration of the understanding about the regulatory framework and, and requirements as research moves from a good idea toward that product that will really make a difference um, in people's medicine cabinets and in the marketplace. Um, and there's a lot that's going on, and it's so important because this research informs whole categories of products. It's not the kind of research that any given company will necessarily undertake because it has uncertainties and it's expensive. And for their one product, if they can just produce the data that's necessary to get over the finish line, that's terrific. But if we can actually identify the tools for better predictive toxicology or biomarkers or innovative clinical trial designs that can be broadly applicable, that benefits whole categories of products, as I said, and, and whole populations of people. So we're involved in collaborations with academic institutions, with, with um, NIH, um, with the Reagan Udall Foundation, a new foundation that actually Mark chairs um, that was created to help support important research activities um, uh, that will help us fulfill the mission of FDA. Um, and I think there are huge opportunities to develop more of these collaborations, to institutionalize them in new ways. Actually, the user fee reauthorization legislation has a new focus for the first time on the importance and the opportunities in the regulatory science arena in some key areas. And I'm hoping that through discussions such as these, we will continue to flesh out this critical research agenda, how the different sectors can make um, the important contributions that need to be made, and how we can really move to the next level in terms of advancing um, the scientific foundation that must underlie all that we do. Thank you. Thank you. A really interesting time at the FDA and some uh, very important new initiatives that uh, the agency is undertaking in collaboration with uh, many other groups. Uh, Kevin, I'd like to turn to you next. Thanks, Mark. Please. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Thanks a lot for uh, coming today, and I'm, I'm honored to be on such a distinguished panel. Uh, you know who these people are and, and what their great enterprises do. You may not know so much about the place I've been for the last 20 years. I've been at Amgen for 20 years as either the president or the CEO. I was just relieved about three weeks ago as CEO, and I'm now the chairman, at least until the end of the year. Uh, I've seen Amgen in that period of time grow from a little bit less than a billion dollars in revenue to almost 17 billion, and that's all been, with the exception of $800 million, organic growth, and we've gone from two to, I'm not sure how many now, 12 or 13 products. And I suppose over those 20 years, or at least over the 12 years I was CEO, we spent on the order of $60 billion in research and development. It wasn't always successful, but we tried to get better all the time. The only reason I share that is, is to tell you that maybe I don't have much wisdom, but at least I have a lot of experience. Uh, and in the public policy area, I'm uh, proud to say that uh, while my friend Jeff Kindler gets hammered by the Wall Street Journal every time they get a chance for somehow striking some deal with the government on the uh, uh, health care legislation, Jeff was not alone. There were four others of us who were right with him, and I'm proud of the work we did there. It's not a perfect bill. It never would be, but I think it advanced the interests of our country and our citizens and was a step forward. And as Mark said, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to work with uh, the commissioner and her staff as the representative of the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industry in the recently passed uh, PDUFA legislation. Lots and lots of lessons there, too. So I've had a chance to participate on the development side, the commercial side, and the public policy side. So I've, I've kind of seen a lot. 
And I'm going to try to keep my remarks at a little bit, maybe a little bit different level than my colleagues here today, maybe a little bit higher level. Um, I know in this town particularly, it's popular to be pretty depressed. It's sort of, you know, it, it's how you guys justify your existence. You know, things are so bad they need us. Uh, we'd have a debate on that. Uh, senator uh, Bennett's a, a really fine senator. He's a home state senator. I think he, he spoke words of real reason. But I acknowledge every issue the United States have, every one. And I probably got 10 more, and they're serious. They've always been serious. Um, Anybody around when Nixon got almost impeached? Anybody around in Vietnam? Anybody around in the 60s? I've seen a lot worse than this, a lot worse. So we just had lamentations about the decline of our industry. I'm here to tell you that biotechnology is not threatened internationally. We do dominate the world. There's nobody close. And if we hold up Europe as a model for anything, I think you ought to take another trip over there because uh, they're not. And we do business in 60 countries. We have good relations with those governments. I understand their health care systems well. They have some elements that are good, uh, but I don't want to adopt any of them. In fact, when the uh, foreign minister of France, who is a physician or was a physician or was the health care minister, uh, was promoted to be foreign minister, he still wanted to see me anyway. And he basically said to me, and, and the French guys specialize in intimidating non-French people, if you haven't been there. <laughs> and uh, they were doing a pretty good job uh, on me that day, but I, I sort of rallied. And he said, hey, uh, it's important to us that uh, here in the EU that we develop biotechnology as an industry. We, we think it's fundamental to our future success, the health of our citizens, our industrial, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, hey, uh, I notice you guys have 98% of all the biotechnology assets in the world, and you have run for a long time the biggest biotechnology company in the world. So how the heck did that happen? What can we do here in France to kind of get in the game? I took the bait, and I told him. And all I did was simply describe what my colleagues here, I think, have rightly described as the American ecosystem which has elements of how big our market is, the FDA, investment in science, partnerships between academia and medicine and business, et cetera, et cetera. And very interesting. This guy pretended like he didn't understand English, but he did. <laughs> and one of my friends, my French friend, when I was going to see this guy before uh, the meeting, and I was pretty hopped up that I was going to see the foreign minister of France, my French buddy said, hey, don't get too hopped up. This guy's really in France, Tom DeLay. But uh, so I, I got hosed off a little bit seeing a guy, but, but I could just see his eyes glazed over. You know, you know, he's talked to people, their eyes glaze over because what he knew, he couldn't match our ecosystem. He knew it. I also had a talk with the chancellor of Germany once, and he said, hey, you guys are going to build a new, you know, we're, we're going into biotechnology here. It's really going to be big in Germany, and we're going to do all this good stuff. And I told him, I said, hey, Chancellor, you know, the problem is we're the biggest biotech company in the world. We do business in your country. You guys have never talked to us. We're going to build a brand new factory. You're not even on the long list for the following six reasons. You couldn't really be serious about what you're saying. So the point I'm trying to make here is we've got a good system here. It is imperfect. It is imperfect. And it can be improved, and it needs to be improved. But nobody else is close to us, not close. I hope that's not taken as a statement of arrogance. I don't mean it that way. I think it's a statement of the way things are right now. I also recognize that all the statistics that are quoted and will be quoted later about all the dopes who run these big companies, of which I'm one, <laughs> and they're, you know, they're failing miserably, and you know, here's all the statistics and all that stuff. Uh, OK, I'll, I'll take that. You know, the statistics are the statistics. But I want to tell you that I'm a guy who's seen a little bit. I was chief engineer of a Los Angeles-class submarine. I ran GE satellite business. I uh, worked in telecommunications. So I've sort of been around. There is nothing in human affairs in the world of business that is more complicated and difficult than developing an innovative biopharm biomedicine. Nothing. Nothing's even close. I'm an engineer. I'm a trained engineer, an aeronautical engineer. And I'll tell you, from an engineer's point of view, you look at biology, it is so complicated that it, it just boggles your mind. 
We're talking about n-dimensional space. We do know more about biology. We know more all the time, but we know precious little. So the question, the first question I always ask, and I'm the guy who would authorize spend a billion dollars on that development project, the first question I'd always ask is, hey, how does this work? And why do you think you know that it works? And the number of times that we have really profoundly sort of convincing answers to that question are very, very few. And it's not because people are not working hard or aren't serious or aren't giving it at their all. It is the fundamental complexity of biology. However complicated you think it is, it's a lot more complicated. Once we understand the biology, then everything else flows. Everything else flows. We can do it better. We can certainly do it better. And the advances that were mentioned today are exciting. I'm enthusiastic about it. But I think we need to keep in mind here today how complicated it is and what a relatively good position we're in. So what Mark asked me to comment on is, hey, so what ideas do I have? Okay. My idea is at a relatively high level, and I know this room has a number of physicians in it, so I'll sort of take a page from your playbook. First, do no harm. So let's talk about how we can do no harm. First thing is we need to keep investing in the NIH. It is a national treasure. It is unmatched anywhere in the world in its scale in its productivity, in its connection to industry, in its connection to medicine. It is a national treasure. We've got to invest there. One of the things that America can do is we've got the money and the scale to do that. Two, we've got to leave the commissioner and her team at the FDA who are good people doing a really hard job who only get criticized. They only get criticized. We've got to let them do their job, depoliticize that, which I believe it largely is, keep funding them, and let them do their work. I think the deal that was just struck, the legislation passed, is a great framework. We do need to fix immigration. If America isn't the place where the best and the brightest want to come, we're in trouble. Our country's story was written on the basis of immigration. Everybody here is an immigrant at one level of your generation or not, whether you know it or not. We can't import drugs. That's a really dumb idea. Okay? If you want to import somebody else's economy into the United States and gut our innovation, go ahead and import drugs, let alone the problem that the commissioner is going to have telling you they're safe, which she's gone on record public as saying she can't. But we do the innovation for the world, and if you import somebody else's price system into our country, you're going to gut it. Uh, next, we've got to fix the macro fiscal problems in America. The political class is clearly failing America right now. There's not leadership anywhere. It's a bunch of people talking past each other. If the right 15 people got in a room, we could solve this thing in an hour. Uh, this is not intellectually complex, but they're failing and maybe we get the politicians we deserve. And finally, we need to cut out one part of the health care legislation that is such a bad idea that the industry came within a whisker of withdrawing support at the last hour. It's called the Independent Payment Advisory Panel. It is really a dumb idea. It's going to be 14 or so unelected, unaccountable people who basically can set price controls. Price controls don't work. They're the single most damaging thing you can do. And it was really, really a bad idea. Uh, I think the health care law is OK. I support it. I hope the Supreme Court doesn't strike it down. But that element of it is a profoundly bad idea. So that's my quick list. And the guy held one up, and I stopped talking. <laughs> uh, Better thank, than the rest of us. So thank, <laughs> thanks, Kevin. Well, I, I, so the, the panel, is, is, uh, as expected, covered a, a whole spectrum of issues. And I think uh, uh, you all, so at least I certainly got a good perspective on the overall ecosystem and how much really bears on the uh, development of better treatments. 
Um, I do want to ask a couple of uh, follow-up questions on some of the topics that came up. And uh, again, thank you all for, for covering a lot of ground in, uh, in, your, in your comments. Um, one of the comments that came up, and I'm, and I'm come back to, to Kevin's discussion of the, the ecosystem and what's uh, uh, and, and, and doing no harm uh, with respect to overall financial incentives and, and um, uh, incentives for product development. But uh, getting back to this point that many of you raised about making the development process more efficient, uh, it is, as Kevin said, very complicated biology, uh, very complicated science and, and engineering. Uh, but uh, many of you identified both in the, the, the mm -hmm. preclinical setting mm -hmm. and then in the clinical setting yeah. opportunities to predict better which yep. treatments are going to yep. work. And uh, I think, Ron, as you said it, yep. uh, the, the uh, high rate of failure at stage two and stage three is at least in part a preclinical problem part. of not yeah. having all of these uh, scientific issues uh, worked out. Uh, and on the post-market side, uh, Peggy, you emphasize the opportunities for collaborations, collaborations that go beyond individual companies and their own experience with products for validating uh, uh, early indicators of toxicity, validating early indicators of, uh, say, surrogate markers of, of patient response. Uh, could you all expand a little bit more about how that can happen more effectively? It does seem like it's a, a degree that requires a degree of knowledge, integration, and collaboration. It would yeah. be very hard for an academic center or a company to do since they all have critical pieces of this evidence. Right. Uh, well, I think that one, there are a couple of um, motivating factors that I think are important to understand. First and foremost, the comment that we really need to support the kinds of platforms like the NCATs uh, with respect to our investments in this nation are extremely important. But one also has to try to incentivize the system, especially biotech, fledgling biotech companies, if we were to, in some way, um, support uh, in uh, either an economic sense or from a timing standpoint, acceleration of approval, et cetera, for any assets that come to a lead clinical candidate stage that has a label, that you actually invest in those in the science needed to be able to understand exactly which patient population to go into, and there's enough preclinical model systems for us to be able to do that. The other area that needs to be strongly supported, incentivized, is that once things get into the clinic, those early stage clinical trials is an extraordinary opportunity for us to learn why drugs are working and why they are not working. But when you talk to small biotech companies, you, they're challenged by timelines, they're challenged by the fact that it costs a great deal of money to do serial biopsies. At MD Anderson, we, we did close to 2,000 patients in phase one last year alone. And if we were to say, let's say it costs $100,000 extra per patient to do that kind of study, you're only talking about $200 million. And, and many different clinical trials were done uh, under, that, under that umbrella. So the opportunity to learn a great deal as to why drugs are responding or not, or why you get the kinds of toxicities you get by looking at germline um, elements to help shepherd uh, patients, not just towards effective therapies, but uh, therapies that are safe, I, I think are unmined at this point. So we have to think about what are either the uh, economic or operational incentives that would allow biotechnology companies to move forward but also fund those kinds of initiatives that are the applied science, not the discovery science, but the kinds of engineering types of activities that can go on in academia to bring things down the field to a higher point of visibility. Now that's a different kind of infrastructure than traditional individual institution uh, research trials, both preclinical and clinical. It fits, uh, Francis, with some of the infrastructure that I know you're developing. I would like your comments on that, but also on uh, how you can bring more private sector support into this, more private sector investment, as uh, Ron was emphasizing. So I appreciate that you're asking us to think about that entire spectrum uh, from very preclinical activities all the way through uh, to clinical, including post-marketing. And let me just float another idea that's being kicked around because I think it would be a, a change in infrastructure that could be pretty exciting. Uh, after all, we are facing a circumstance at last uh, where in this country uh, there will be substantial numbers of individuals with electronic health records. 
If you simply try to create a national research network uh, where you link together uh, those health services organizations that have large numbers of participants with EHRs, uh, you could readily reach uh, 20 or 30 million covered lives, putting together the Kaisers, the Geisingers, the Intermountains, the Mayos, and a few others. Suppose we were to invest in the infrastructure to turn that into not only a health delivery system, but also a research system. Mm -hmm. Uh, putting in place then research personnel at each of those institutions in a circumstance where you could very quickly uh, initiate clinical trials, both observational, which would almost be free because you'd already have the information at your fingertips, or even interventional, where you could randomize either individually or in a cluster strategy, a whole host of questions. Think how valuable that would be, even going beyond the Sentinel network, which is already being set up to look at post-marketing signals of toxicity. If you had the opportunity to follow people longitudinally, <clears throat> and if you had that number of covered lives for which you had informed patient consent uh, to participate, I think this is a feasible next step uh, to empower clinical research to go in a direction where you could do many more trials at much lower uh, marginal cost because you will have effectively already capitalized the infrastructure. And you don't have to build the infrastructure each time you're starting a new trial and then tear it down again. You have it there as a foundation to conduct many kinds of studies, whether it's pharmacogenomics, whether it's back pain, whatever, you'd have that kind of opportunity. I think that might be something we could talk about at this current time, building upon the fact that finally we might actually have systems in the U.S. to be able to collect the kind of medical information you'd like to have. Thanks. And next up, our ecosystem. Uh, other comments on this topic, uh, Peggy or Kevin? Well, I think there's there are so many threads that one could pick up on and and really uh, develop. What Francis was just saying, you know, reminded me of another point that I think is worth at least putting on the table, which is that we have extraordinary new opportunities to delve more deeply into data because of the advances in information technology as well, and whether it's electronic health records and the kinds of activities Francis was talking about proactively using the collection of, of information from patient experience and their electronic health records um, to inform our, our information about um, uh, products or using uh, data mining and information technology to uh, use those same kinds of databases to better understand the real world experience in terms of emerging safety concerns, et cetera, and our post-market surveillance activities that we are deeply engaged in uh, with Sentinel and, and other um, activities. But also, um, as we're learning more about underlying mechanisms of disease and um, genetic markers and other important um, biomarkers, the opportunity to look at existing databases um, and try to, to take another look at, at some of the work that's already been done using new tools and understandings to sort of see whether we had studies, for example, that might have had a, a population that in fact was heterogeneous in terms of response, but we thought it was homogeneous and we missed an important treatment effect or understood that there was an overwhelming adverse event that made that product not desirable when in fact one could now identify subpopulations of responders uh, or subpopulations of people who suffered from the adverse uh, reactions and, in fact, define an important use for a product that we had otherwise thought, um, you know, was not acceptable um, or effective. So I think there are, there are a lot of opportunities. It, it again does require us to think in some new ways and to engage in partnerships because some of this data belongs to companies. In fact, we need to make sure that we all understand and see value in certain kinds of um, of studies and approaches, and with respect to electronic health records, there are obviously are privacy issues that we have to address um, carefully and thoughtfully. But I think that working together and identifying what are some of the critical opportunities, um, doing some projects to really validate that yes, these approaches will make a difference and will have benefits, um, I think we can continue to build out new areas of science and, and new areas of medical care and treatment um, by 
bringing information technology and, um, and the world of engineering as well, I might say, uh, into our efforts as life scientists. Let me ask one uh, final question about the um, economic incentives to support this uh, whole uh, ecosystem of investment in, in uh, innovation, which, as Kevin pointed out, is, uh, uh, is very complicated and, and therefore is very risky. Uh, we made it, uh, Kevin, I think most of the way through this panel without, actually most of the way through the morning, without a, even a mention of the uh, Affordable Care Act. And I have to say, uh, we, we did place a bet on timing of the Supreme Court decision and scheduling this event for today. Uh, I said something uh, about there's one element that. I hate. That's right. And I think, uh, so that, that's, I, like I guess, my, my qu the question I was getting to is, um, uh, as Ron said, uh, look, if we are really going to deal with the demographic challenges and the opportunities of building on this science, it's going to take more biomedical innovation, uh, um, much as uh, a, a few more uh, tweaks in uh, legislation on healthcare financing could help. But uh, are there some uh, very important challenges, very important opportunities from the economic incentive side that you all think are, are most important here? Uh, um, Kevin, sounds like you'd like to see the uh, Supreme Court uh, declare the IPAB unconstitutional. Um, in any other comments from the panel about uh, the interaction between Supreme Court decision, healthcare reform, and and the, the, the biomedical enterprise that we've been discussing this morning. I mean, I, I, I'd comment. I, I think that the health care reform is misnamed. It's really insurance reform. It does, this is not a criticism. I, I applaud the effort. But in fact, it makes almost no impact on the fundamentals of the American economic health care system. It has a lot of consequence in the insurance area, which is fine and good. But that's like another week conversation. But what do we what do we need to do on the economic incentives to, to support the kinds of things that Ron would describe? I think the economic, the kinds of incentive, I think the economic incentives are fine in America. If you develop an innovative medicine, I guarantee you uh, the society will pay for it. If somebody in my world comes up with, and it will be my world, a cure for Alzheimer's, they'll be rewarded, and they should be. So I, I think one of the the glories of the American system is. We fundamentally understand value, and we will pay for it, and we will reward success. We're not perfect. We're not perfect, but we're so much better than anybody else. If there's any place I'd rather have a successful biomedical innovation in America, I don't know it, because the investor will get the reward. Look at the stock market returns. Yeah, lots of companies fail, but that's sort of the way it goes. Uh, I think we're actually in a pretty good, pretty good shape. I agree completely. Um, there's another dimension that we really haven't talked about, which uh, the ACA is focused on, and I think it's a very good aspect, which is the emphasis on prevention. And uh, one of the things that is challenging from a commercialization standpoint are things that might be preventive, interventive, uh, or uh, early detection strategies from a diagnostic standpoint. Uh, think about the current advances that are, are resident in serum proteomics, imaging technology, the ability to develop high-risk models so you can identify among the 30 million smokers who are the 10 million that are hardwired for progression towards malignancy. If you knew that and then couple that to advances in imaging and serum proteomics, you would dramatically impact on the disease and, and upstage the cancer in a way that would dramatically reduce mortality. So ask, is there, um, are, are, is there a system from a uh, execution and commercialization standpoint that we currently have in place that ensures sharp focus on those critical issues that will allow us to develop the kinds of tests that would really change the practice, practice of medicine in the general population? I think on the therapeutic side, there's been an enormous amount of attention, appropriately so. There's still obviously major unmet needs, but in thinking about development of risk models, development of preventive strategies, development of early diagnostics that allow us to detect the disease at the earliest stages, that when you have tau accumulation or in your brain and you're on your way to getting Alzheimer's, or to be able to say that you, you have stage one melanoma, or ovarian cancer at stage one, to be able to identify that would have an enormous economic impact. The incentives aren't quite there on the diagnostic side as they are on the therapeutic side. It's changed and it is moving in the right direction, but incentivizing that, accelerating that, would have a dramatic impact on cancer in this decade if we were to have tests for early detection. 
I think the others? economic incentive I would point to is maybe where I started, and that is that we are potentially now squandering the uh, opportunities of our young scientists uh, to really flex their muscles and show what they can do in terms of innovation. Uh, and I appreciate the, all the positive comments made this morning about NIH and its contribution to building this foundation of basic science upon which uh, the future of biomedicine is built, and yet we are not taking full advantage of that. And we are putting a lot of investments into training individuals uh, to be really remarkably creative, visionary scientists, and then we're making it very hard for them in many instances to actually live out that dream. Uh, again, if there is a way to turn the corner uh, from what has been a steady deterioration of support uh, for basic biomedical research at NIH over the last nine years, uh, that would be a very valuable economic incentive for the whole engine. People say, well, you know, NIH got the doubling. Aren't you satisfied? That was nine years ago. Uh, we've effectively been undoubled since then. <laughs> and if the real dream here uh, is to have that part of the ecosystem, upon which everything else rests, uh, as fully vigorous as it could be, uh, then we, we need a change in the trajectory. Uh, Peggy, any final Well, I, I don't want to use up too much time so that we can get some other questions, but, um, you know, obviously these, these are challenging times, and we have to think about, you know, where are the critical um, uh, points where we have to make sure that no matter how tight the dollars, we are continuing to invest because it matters for the longer term. And I think what we've been talking about today, you know, really is one such example that, that you know, we, we cannot starve the engines of innovation. Um, and we, we have to, I think, really address, you know, this ecosystem and recognize that there are many components, certainly NIH uh, being key, I appreciated. Kevin's comment about uh, the importance of a strong FDA as well, and um, but but we have to make sure that 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 this this partnership, this set of of key stakeholders and players, you know, all continue to work together, and that we really identify where are the points of overlap and synergy, so we're not duplicating effort, but so that we are building on each other's work and really maximizing it, whether it's the young researcher in a lab. Um, in an academic institution, not just thinking about the excitement of the discovery, but also thinking about understanding that there's a broader world in which that discovery uh, will have to develop towards application and um, not just doing another experiment because it's interesting, but doing another experiment because it adds to, to that, that base, having industry, um, you know, be part of, of, of the discussions about uh, the world as they see it, and it's been very valuable for us as we've thought about regulatory reform to really understand from small businesses and big pharma, you know, what are the challenges in navigating uh, the FDA system? How can we be uh, clearer about what our expectations and standards are? How can we work to really um, streamline and modernize our systems so that we can do the best job possible. And I think, you know, working with NIH to really define a research agenda that, that covers the whole spectrum from the bench um, to what will really need, be needed at the bedside is absolutely essential to our success. Well, I want to thank you and all of our, the panelists uh, for the very broad and provocative, but also uh, very specific discussion about some steps that can help to build on uh, the, the innovation system, the innovation ecosystem that we have in place now. We are going to get on to much more discussion of these issues uh, after a short break, but right now I'd really like to thank uh, all of our panelists for taking time out of an extremely busy schedule. I didn't realize you were actually all in the overtime. Oh, my goodness. I thought